Good afternoon, friends. Uh, hope you're doing well despite these tough equity and crypto markets. Uh, also to our clients in Florida, I pray that you are safe and have avoided major harm. My name is John Bay. I'm managing partner here at Fundstrat. As many of you know, uh, we launched our blockchain crypto consulting, consulting service back in November of 2018. Since then, we have consulted over 30 protocols, companies, blockchain uh, exchanges, miners, funds, what have you. And we continue to grow as the space has become mainstream. Today, I'm thrilled to feature a very high profile and a very, very special protocol, Cardano. Cardano is a very exciting open source blockchain that leverages proof of stake mechanism like no other. Using the UTXO model, Cardano provides tremendous long-term viable rewards. In a minute, you will learn a lot more about merits of this great platform. Founded seven years ago by our speaker today, Charles Hoskinson, Cardano has a major global following. Uh, not surprisingly, ADA, the Native token is top five uh, in coin market cap. Um, quick background on Charles, even though he doesn't need any introduction. Many of you know Charles was one of the founders of Ethereum. He also founded Invictus Innovations. He is an absolute pioneer and thought leader in the space. We're truly thrilled to have him today. Uh, there will be an introduction by our own thought leader, my partner and head of research, Tom. The moderator for our Q&A will be my colleague and head of our digital assets consulting, Sean Farrell. There will be a Q&A, as I mentioned, at the end of the presentation. You could use uh, the button on the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Uh, and as usual, we will be sending out replay information. As always, on behalf of Tom and all of my colleagues, uh, we're grateful for your support and business. Feel free to email me or your sales rep with any suggestions and thoughts. I will now turn the mic over to my partner, Tom. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks, John. Um, I'm very delighted to be introducing Charles Hoskinson to our group. Um, I met Charles in 2017 at a digital currency group offsite that was put together. And uh, I was struck at the time by really a lot of the great ideas Charles has had. And, and he's continued to talk about these as I've seen them over the years. And I, out of curiosity, I did look back at where uh, the price was in 2017. It was two cents and roughly a $3 million market cap. And today, uh, even with crypto prices have been corrected, it's still well over a billion dollars. So um, it just shows you that uh, there, are, there are some things happening here that I think have been really led by the community and the strong community presence. And it's something I think that Sean uh, has mentioned in, in his commentary and his pieces, whether you look at it through engagement um, or the reach of the community. And um, so I'm, I, I think it's going to be a very useful uh, 45 minutes to an hour, a good introduction. And I think before I sort of turn it over to Charles, I do want to just make take a step back and talk about why investors need to adjust their time frames. Because, you know, if we're, if we're looking at screens every day, we're just seeing red. Uh, and it's obviously, it's painful and miserable. And But we know that this is almost solely due to a singular focus on central banks around the world trying to kill inflation. And inflation is not going to be with us forever. And I think the one big takeaway I have from looking at the 70s through the 80s is that that pivot, not the central bank itself, but when inflation itself begins to cool and markets are convinced, that's the time that markets begin to find their footing. And that's why, you know, as much as investors are uncertain now and they put so much weight on the CPI reports, I think that there's just building and mounting evidence that this inflationary surge is behind us. How low it goes is still unknown and how quickly, but we are through the worst of this now. And that's why I think it, it is important to adjust timeframes and think about 
the future. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Charles and Sean. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here at uh, Funstrat. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, so uh, I do these webinars from time to time and talk to a variety of different people. Usually we talk to a lot of scientists and engineers, but it's always fun to talk to the people in the banking industry because a big part of the cryptocurrency space is asking a very fundamental question of how do you make markets more global, more efficient, safer, more transparent, and ultimately work better for everybody, uh, the 7 billion people in the world, not just the people who are banked in the current system. So I've been in the cryptocurrency space for a very long time, since before Ethereum existed. Uh, and uh, actually it was around 2011 when I joined. Uh, and I started as a miner and a speculator, and I was really interested in the technology, but there was not much you could do with Bitcoin. That was kind of the first generation from 2009 to 2013. And there was very fun. It was an open source project. Uh, so uh, crazy uh, parties and lots of meetup groups and nobody had any money. Uh, and wild ideas. Uh, and for the most part, no one took us seriously. We didn't take ourselves seriously. And the total value of all digital assets that were in the cryptocurrency space were under a billion dollars. Then in 2013, something very significant happened. Uh, the Cypriot crisis led to Bitcoin uh, rising in value to about $250 token. And then suddenly people started taking our industry seriously. And we saw the rise of VC investment, professional exchanges, and actually, a lot of entrepreneurs saying we should work full time in this industry and do something. The problem with Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is a great proof of concept. As a first generation, it shows you how to have a decentralized money, a decentralized value transfer system. And uh, that's phenomenal, but it can't do pull payments. Uh, it's not programmable. You can't issue assets. It has very long latency times, uh, 60 minutes for settlement these types of things. So a ton of applications just simply don't work. It's much like the web pre-JavaScript, uh, where we had beautiful little HTML pages, and you could put little flaming graphics, and you can have nice text and images, but you can't interact with the website in a reasonable way. Then JavaScript comes, and then suddenly the web is programmable, and then you have Web 2, and you have Facebook and Amazon and YouTube and the dawn of social media, the dawn of uh, user-created content and a, a very beautiful web. So analogously, in 2013, a lot of people were attempting to upgrade Bitcoin or build competing products that would have programmability. So with respect to upgrading Bitcoin, uh, there were projects like Color Coins and MasterCoin. Uh, and unfortunately, as, as inspired as they were, the limitations of Bitcoin as a platform made it too difficult for them to be commercially viable. But they did have concepts of user-issued assets and smart contracts and these things. Then there were a collection of projects that were launched. Uh, for example, NXT, I launched a project called BitShares when I was at Invictus Innovations. And each of those were trying to do specific things. Like with BitShares, we were trying to do DEXs and stable coins, algorithmic stable coins way back in 2013. So we were a little ahead of the, uh, of the curve. Uh, but it turned out Ethereum, uh, the project I later joined uh, and helped co-found ended up being the dominant standard for the second generation. And what it brought to the market was programmability. So basically, you could suddenly design smart contracts to start replicating what you do on Wall Street and what is commonly done in the broader financial industry. So everything from project financing like ICOs to now things like NFTs, which are collectibles, uh, intellectual property binding, these types of things. The problem with the Ethereum model is that it was never really built, like Bitcoin suffers from the same issue, to scale. So while it's a great proof of concept to show how one would think about programmable assets, programmable transactions, the issue here is that when you go from a million users to 10 million users to 100 million users, the system really doesn't perform very well and it has exponential increase in cost. Uh, and so Ethereum itself has been trying to upgrade to resolve that problem but it led to a conversation about what would the next generation look like. And I'd argue there are kind of three branches that come off. So one is scale. So as you gain users, you keep the same level of performance or gain performance, kind of like BitTorrent in that respect, where if many people download a movie, you get it faster. If few people download, you get it slower. Interoperability, because at some point these systems have to merge with the legacy financial system. So how do you handle things like compliance, identity? Um, how do you handle uh, things like ISO 222 or the open banking movement and so forth? And how do you connect those things into? So what is the Wi-Fi moment of the cryptocurrency space where everything just kind of works together 
and it's easy to move people, assets, and information between systems. And then finally, governance. And so if these are truly decentralized, there's no custodial company. There's nobody in charge. There's no Microsoft to Windows or Apple to the iPhone or Google to the Android. Uh, so you need some sort of mechanism where it's almost like a co-op or a bottom-up structure where you actually can converge on how do we upgrade the system. So given that these are such radical departures from just programmability or decentralized money, you really do need a fundamentally different set, a set of protocols. So back in 2015, a consortium came together, Emergo, uh, later the Cardano Foundation, which was a spoke organization created for this end, and my company. And what we decided to do is embark upon a long arc research agenda and then a long arc product engineering agenda to design and then deploy a cryptocurrency that would have protocols in each of these categories. And so it would carry the smart contracts from the second generation. It would carry the decentralization and this idea of uh, this deflationary monetary policy like Bitcoin has that we kind of know and love, but it would also have something to say about how do you achieve scale? How do you achieve interoperability? How do you achieve governance at a scale of millions of users and ultimately be useful to people? So the first step was that we had to hire an army of scientists and we worked really hard at that. Uh, and uh, we've written now 150 plus research papers out of many different labs at different universities. We now have labs at Stanford, University of Edinburgh, uh, Univer uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology, University of Athens, University of Wyoming, uh, and let's see here, what else? University of Connecticut and a few more. It's a pretty long list. I can't even remember all of them now. And tons of professors in many different fields, some who are domain experts in game theory, some who are experts in distributed systems, some who are experts in privacy and uh, zero knowledge cryptography, some who are experts in programming language theory, uh, law and policy, business. It's kind of a multidisciplinary collaboration. And basically asking the question, what types of protocols and what type of software and processes would be required to have a system that can operate at a scale of millions to billions of people efficiently and also be useful for those people in many different contexts, both regulated and unregulated, yet is built in a way that it's truly a transnational system, meaning it's not beholden to one regulatory framework or one custodial group. So in those papers, we then took the code and we said, well, if we're going to write this protocol, we should do it in an evidence-based way. And that's the way that software is developed uh, when you take a look at things like aerospace software, healthcare software. So basically high assurance systems, systems where if the system fails, people die or billions of dollars are lost. And we've seen many examples of what happens when you have software failures like the Boeing 737 MAX, for example, uh, or rockets that were improperly designed. So we took the best practices of high assurance software and we hired formal methods engineers and we wrote specifications and code in very specific languages that would enable us to have a chain of evidence to show that the protocols that were peer reviewed at major venues like crypto, Eurocrypt and CCS through the academic process were implemented with high fidelity, meaning we had a strong belief that these protocols were built correctly. The aggregation of all this work was launching Cardano in 2017 after a lot of effort. It was called the Byron era, and uh, it was mostly a proof of concept. Uh, it was uh, Thomas did mention that we met back then, and I think we were in Singapore at the Marina Bay Sands at that one conference, and a really exciting time. And since we launched, we've grown to millions of users. There's about 1,200 projects actively building in some way on Cardano, and we've gone through multiple eras. So from Byron to Shelley, the Shelley era brought in, went from a static and federated system to a dynamic and decentralized system. There's now more than 3000 stake pools operating the ledger, making us one of the most decentralized protocols in the space. By the way, decentralized without having to lock funds. So 74% of all funds are connected to the consensus mechanic, but you don't have to like Ethereum lock them the Hotel California of cryptocurrencies, you can check in, but you can't check out. You have full liquidity in that respect. And then after Shelley, we went to the Gogan era um, last year with the Alonzo hard fork, and that introduced the extended UTXO accounting model, and it introduced smart contracts. Now, what's really cool about the way that we've designed things is we took the best that we saw in the Ethereum ecosystem and the Bitcoin ecosystem and brought it into the modern era. For example, with Bitcoin, 
there were a lot of really great novel ideas on how to issue assets and go to a multi-asset system. They were called color coins. The issue is that Bitcoin was never designed for it. So they were always grafted on and you got a suboptimal issuer and user experience as a result, and also incompatibility between different color kernels. So what we did is we took that model and said, well, let's put it on chain and we created a native asset standard. So issuing assets in Cardano means that when you issue an asset, it's a first class citizen with ADA, the native currency of uh, Cardano. As a result, it makes it significantly easier for exchange listings, for wallet infrastructure, and ultimately to adopt systems like a, one that we've proposed called Babel fees, where you can pay the transaction fees in the native asset itself. So also all the things that would make it easy to manage ADA and compress transactions and handle the account management can be done uh, with native assets that are issued. They're not like Ethereum where they're treated as smart contracts. Second, when we look at the accounting model, one of the things we recognize is that we live in a world of many blockchains. We live in a world with lots of off-chain things happening. We live in a world with legacy financial systems. Uh, this may be a surprise to 25-year-old open source developers, but apparently there's trillions of dollars of infrastructure that tends to still be alive and we need to be interoperable with it. And there's a whole marketplaces that exist above and beyond the Ethereum model. So it was very clear to us that we needed to construct an accounting model uh, that allowed us to just as easily do things on chain as we do off chain and be able to take a lot of the techniques like ZK rollups, state channels, and other things that are proposed as major scalability solutions for achieving scale in the millions to billions of users and find a way to make those isomorphic, meaning that they play very nicely with each other. And the things that happen off chain, you get security guarantees that they'll settle and reconcile correctly on chain. So we took the Bitcoin accounting model, which is a great model, but the problem is it's not programmable. And we extended that model and then put on a very high security programming language on top. And what this allowed us to do is effectively have a smart contract model where you start reimagining how smart contracts work. First, you no longer think about transactions per second. You actually go to a higher level of abstraction of transactions per transaction. One transaction on Cardano can actually have hundreds, if not thousands of events occur, depending upon how the system grows and how people use it. So for example, think of an NFT drop or an issuance to many users. In Ethereum, it's a serial system. It's You have to do one, then the next one, then the next one. So if you're issuing lots of assets, you potentially have to issue hundreds of transactions, if not thousands to do that. With Cardano, it's just UTXO. So one set of inputs and a bunch of outputs and each one maps to a different address. So one transaction can do the load of many things. Furthermore, because of the way UTXO works, that these are pass fail, relatively stateless things that are, are mostly immutable, uh, that system works very well for translating decades of distributed systems theory about concurrency and parallelism from the functional programming space into the cryptocurrency space. As a result, we have a much easier time reasoning about both in the theoretical sense and the practical engineering sense about how one would lock funds and move them to different networks and move things back and forth like state channels or doing a roll-up scheme and so forth. The long-term common sense advantage of that is that basically you can achieve huge scale over time. And you can reuse a lot of good ideas from the past and not have to figure out new things like what many of the competitors, the product have been. The other advantage of using a safe language like Plutus is that one of the things we've noticed and predicted during the life of the Cardano program has been that there are going to be a tremendous amount of hacks. The problem with dApps, smart contracts, is you have the largest possible attack surface. Everyone can see your code, Everybody knows how much money it's worth to hack you, and everybody has access to your system. This is, by definition, the worst case scenario for software to operate in. And thus, you have to be exceedingly careful about the design of your system. As predicted, tens of billions of dollars of hacks from the DAO hack to the Nomad Bridge hack and so many things in between have happened as a result of poorly constructed smart contracts. So the way you get around that is with good QA, good testing, and ultimately the use of formal methods to verify that your contract can't fail. For example, if it's your belief as a developer that only a certain set of people can withdraw from a contract, you should be able to generate some evidence that that is the case and potentially even exhaust the entire execution space to verify that. If we're to ensure these things, 
put consumer protections into these things, regulate these things. It's exceedingly important that the developer can generate proof that they are reliable. This requires careful consideration at the accounting layer and careful consideration at the contract layer in order to be done. One of the advantages of how we structure the project is from the very beginning, we brought in centuries worth of programming language experience. People who created programming languages and spent decades of their careers, when you combine the careers of all these PL experts together to ask that very basic question, how do we know it's secure? How do we make sure it's semantically correct? And how do we generate evidence that the things that are being said, the things that are being built are what the developers claim? Because at some point, this industry will be regulated. At some point, this industry uh, will have to produce evidence of consumer protection. And if this can be done with a mathematical artifact, that's much more effective than being done with trust us, trust the brand and reputation of the developer. Because as we've seen in the history of the financial industry and many other industries, even the best get it wrong from time to time. So the more that you can remove the human from the process, the better. Furthermore, as we develop out this beautiful framework, what's happened is that we're learning a lot of new and clever ways to handle uh, new types of finance. For example, we've invented as an ecosystem a great new stablecoin called JED as just one of many dApps that are launching in the Cardano ecosystem. This is an algorithmic stablecoin and it's over collateralized. Again, because of that formal methods model, what we were able to do is actually carefully examine the areas of failure that have occurred with coins like Luna and other algorithmic stablecoins and prove that such things can't happen. So while it still can depeg and not be stable, you at least know under what conditions explicitly where that would occur. You see, and that's the power of this type of approach is that in the lab, you can do a lot of research, you can think of a lot of things. And then what you can do is verify that by a small launch and then it grows and you have high assurance that it's likely not going to run into a problem. What's also really cool about this is that we've constructed a decentralized brain as a result of the peer reviewed process. As the project has grown, many of the papers that are now coming out talking about the derivative technologies of cardano are actually made by scientists written by scientists who we don't employ as a core project we have seen dozens of papers written by completely independent academics citing the overall research and creating extensions to the technology this dramatically improves the resilience of the system and dramatically improves the scale of the system in terms of its intellectual reach because at the end of the day, you're not reliant upon a genius founder or a well-endowed foundation or any particular group of, of experts in order for the system to innovate. Just a recent example, a paper out of Stanford called Proof of Proof of Stake actually invented an alternative way of scaling Cardano and then having light clients. And this was done by a completely independent research team. There's also other papers that talk about our network model which said it is actually one of the best in class network models and resolved a lot of problems that other proof of stake cryptos currencies are still struggling with, which is why you see, for example, stalls with Solana, because principally some flaws in the design of the network stack. So that's a, another component. We think a lot about how do you solve problems in general, not in particular. Particular is the needs of today. In general, it's the needs of the future as well. For example, what is the relationship between the performance of the system and the level of decentralization of the system? Many of you who are aware of literature about regulation, there's a big conversation of whether cryptocurrencies should be regulated as securities or whether they should be regulated as commodities or something else, a new category. Regardless of how that falls, one of the key points of discussion that exchanges and regulators are having on a global basis is how truly decentralized is the cryptocurrency? And the problem is we don't have an industry accepted index to actually tell us that. We kind of think Bitcoin is decentralized, but what does that mean? Less than 10 mining operations control the vast majority of the mining power of Bitcoin. Is that decentralized just because there's a lot of users of that? And there's less than 100 core developers who maintain the software that everybody uses in Bitcoin today. Is that decentralized? Well, there's different opinions about that. So one of the things we do as a project is whenever we recognize that there's an issue of measurement, we attempt as an industry to work together and actually create something to resolve that. On the case of decentralization, we're actually setting up at University of Edinburgh Decentralization Index, which will systematically measure each cryptocurrency, starting with Bitcoin and working down to Cardano, and try to produce some form of number where more is better 
more is more decentralized and look at a collection of factors. This can be a tool that regulators can use to see where things they've already said are commodities sit versus other things. So this is part of a larger agenda of making sure that everybody in the industry has objective, fair, neutral indices. This index will be not controlled by IO or another commercial interest, but actually embedded at the University of Edinburgh, an objective neutral body, and the professors and students there will be responsible for maintaining that index moving forward through an endowment process. And so a firewall is put there. Similarly, we can look at things like throughput. And we can also talk about a standards driven process about how do we resolve some of the biggest upcoming challenges in the cryptocurrency space, such as how does one take human identity and put it into the cryptocurrency system. The age of pseudonymity is coming to an end. And we are now living in a situation where it's going to become very important for transactions in the cryptocurrency space to be in some way connected to an identity, especially when people are engaged in regulated commercial activities, like dealing with exchanges, security tokens, or other instruments where there has to be some sort of disclosure and reporting to a regulatory body. If not in the United States, then in the European Union or elsewhere. Now, there are things like the Verite standards and uh, so forth that have been proposed, but the problem is that many of these frameworks really aren't where they need to be in order to be effective from a regulatory viewpoint. The power of Cardano is that we thought about this for a long time and we started engaging with governments early on to have discussions about national ID and digital ID. So some of the projects that we've done include a large scale credentialing program in Ethiopia, one of the hardest jurisdictions currently to operate in. It took four years to put a deal together. Now over 5 million school children are getting their K through 12 credentials onto the Cardano blockchain, and they could use that under their control to apply for higher education. The same framework, we've been discussing abstractions, which would allow for general certification, proof that you're a doctor, proof that you're a lawyer, proof you're a graduate of a particular institution, in addition to membership in groups, like are you a US citizen? Are you under US jurisdiction or are you not? And the power of that coupling is what we think is going to become one of the key differentiators long-term for whether a blockchain survives or not. Regulators seem to be okay with allowing cryptocurrencies to exist in some form, but at the very least for certain activities like anti-terrorist financing, sanctions compliance, anti-money laundering, know your customer, in many contexts, especially with large sums of value, they need at least to have some audit trail, some capability of doing that. The power of these types of systems, when you look at extended UTXO, the DID standard, the PRISM framework that we constructed for Cardano, is that this is very easy for third-party developers to add into their dApps, very easy for third-party developers to add into their wallets, and ultimately very easy for consumers to use. In fact, our staking model will even allow eventually for contingent staking. So right now, for most staking models, there's no notion of who delegates to you or who is actually constructing blocks. With contingent staking, eventually you'll be in a position where when someone delegates to you, it doesn't go active unless the stake pool itself uh, accepts that transaction. And ideally they would do that if there was an identity connected to it. So they can comply with uh, reporting requirements and other such things, especially if they're using stake pools for distributions of funds like ISPOs or these other mechanisms that are in the future. So long and short is that we thought really carefully about what we needed to do today. And we have shown and demonstrated research excellence and created an enormous pile of academic literature, which has gone through the peer review process with over 10,000 citations. That's effectively an academic career for any person. And then we've been able to translate that with evidence into great protocols and have resulted in a very strong evangelistic community. In fact, uh, recently, a major brand agency said that we have the 28th strongest brand of any uh, company or initiative outranking BMW and IBM. And regularly, when you go to Cardano groups, you'll see an enormous amount of evangelism, including uh, people who've named their children after our currency, ADA. Some people have even tattooed our logo on their body. That's a great community, and it's a very strong community. And there's so much community activity that has occurred. 40% uh, of all of our chain activity and projects are related to NFTs, for example, of which over 5 million have been issued from famous musicians like Snoop Dogg's son, 
all the way to small scale community projects that have been able to create metaverse plays and other things. When we look at our financial applications, we have more than a dozen decentralized exchanges that have been launched that have grown exponentially better in terms of their performance and operating costs since the launch of smart contracts, learning as we learn how to build in the extended UTX model and enjoying the safety and security that we've come to know and love in the Cardano ecosystem. As a result of our high assurance engineering practices as well, we're now in a situation where since the launch in 2017, Cardano has never had a downtime, a significant downtime. It's been up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, always reliable, always there, and the core has never been hacked. Now, nothing can prevent, give you complete security. You can't have that, but it's a game of averages and numbers. And when you think to a future where there's a merger of the legacy regulated financial space and the high-tech, fast-moving cryptocurrency space, there has to be some compromises along the way. And we think we're best suited as an ecosystem in order to accommodate that, not just today, but in the future. And finally, when we look to governance, one of the magics of Cardano is that it's evolving very rapidly. The Catalyst program, for example, is a decentralized treasury system that manages over a half billion dollars of growth capital. And the community itself is in charge of that fund. And since the, since the instantiation of it, already nine distribution events have happened to thousands of projects, which has allowed those projects to get the project financing that they need as grants in order to be able to build great open source software for our ecosystem. Many of those 1,200 projects were actually Catalyst members. That's just the beginning of a larger program that's rolling out in 2023, which includes setting up things like members-based organizations to represent the will of the community, significantly enhanced on-chain voting, uh, and then ultimately governance classes to form, not just for Cardano, but also all the applications that are created on top of Cardano. Our view is that over the next three years, most dApps and dApp developers, because of the liability that centralized governance gives them, uh, are going to try to find a way to migrate to chains that provide decentralized governance for them and answer a lot of the hard questions of how does one build a voting system how does one give their community voting rights and sort all these things out? We've pre-constructed Cardano with the native asset design, the Babel feed design, and how we intend on rolling out voting next year to enable that process. And we've tested it uh, with the Catalyst program over the last two years with about 10% of the entire Cardano ecosystem participating, tens of thousands of uh, very evangelistic people. So we've gathered an enormous amount of market data in that respect. So there's a lot of amazing things here. And I wish I had a few hours because we could go through everything from, for example, Hydra and what it can do for DAP specific scalability to Mithril, where actually it allows you to have full node security. So as if you had a full copy of the blockchain, but with a light client, meaning something with kilobytes to megabytes running on a cell phone, thereby ensuring inclusive accountability, not just for the main chain, but also all the side chains that Cardano is going to have and the economics of those side chains and how they help the ecosystem grow. But uh, one of the value propositions of uh, these events is always hearing from everybody here and giving everyone an ample opportunity to ask questions. And so I always try to leave as much time as possible for that. So thank you for coming. And I look forward to uh, answering as many questions as I can in the uh, remaining time we have. Thanks, Charles. That was really great. Um... <clears throat> I think uh, you know. Obviously, we always hope that uh, our clients find our you know our team's reports to be very helpful in learning about these new, these ecosystems and uh, crypto assets. But always uh, you know extra special to hear from you know the founder the founder himself. So appreciate you coming on and sharing that uh, with us, and certainly agree agree with you and Tom's sentiments earlier regarding um, you know the Cardano community. I think if we step back and look at, you know, the the Tom spoke about widening our our time frames, our time horizons, right? And you know, if we're looking to build networks for a hundred, two hundred, a thousand years, uh, an important element to that is is the social layer, right? You know, we're so uh, we're so used to talking about you know base layers, layer twos, modular scale, scaling, etc. People often forget that you know underlying that is just a, a strong uh, strong user base. So, um, you know, I think before we field a couple of uh, uh, audience questions, Charles, I was hoping uh, maybe, you know, Cardano just underwent a pretty big update. Uh, right. So so maybe if we just start off by touching upon uh, the Vassal hard fork, um, you know, what was that? Um, uh, why was it needed? And, and how did it go? 
Well, that's the magic of Cardano is that we have easy upgrades. And so most cryptocurrencies, they have this situation where they have uncontrolled hard forks and it's a very stressful, traumatic event. And you're never really sure if when you upgrade, you're going to end up with another version. Like for example, with Ethereum, they go to the merge. I guess there's now another version of Ethereum, Ethereum proof of work. And then there's also Ethereum classic. Uh, so any, anytime you upgrade a cryptocurrency in this way, the minority chain may live on and create all kinds of problems and chicanery. With Cardano, we have this idea of a hard fork combinator. And so once an update's been initiated, the system auto upgrades and it becomes a superset, which means the old code still runs, but then uh, the new stuff also runs and it kind of telescopes in. So Vossel is an example of that. It's one of the many hard fork combinator events that's been done. And it added new functionalities in a new Plutus programming language, Plutus version two. And uh, basically this was a, a version of the language that took a year to build. We did it with the community. Many DAP developers came and they said, these are our frustrations. These are the things we're looking for. These are the things we need. And through a standards driven process, the SIP process, uh, Cardano improvement proposals, uh, many of those updates worked their way into Vossel. And it has practically, when you look at the real life implications of it, resulted in many cases, a 10 X reduction uh, in transaction size for dApps and about a reduction of half in transaction fees. For example, Muesli Swap, which is one of the DEXs, their average transaction size was about 13 kilobytes. Now it's about 1.3 kilobytes and their average transaction fee per, uh, per transaction was about 1.5 ADA. Now it's 0.7 ADA. So it's a massive improvement that not only enhanced the language, but also the consensus layer to do pipelining and uh, pipelining increased the throughput of the system in many cases by about 500%. So better, faster, cheaper, uh, a lot more community participation in the development of the language and more utility that's going to enable uh, a huge wave of dApps now to come into Cardano. Just briefly about our programming model, there's two ways you can build a smart contract programming model. It's a spectrum and it's about expressiveness. You can start with maximum expressiveness, which means do everything that Java can do or everything that Python can do or C++ can do. The problem is that introduces a huge attack surface of potential places that things can go wrong. And then reduce expressiveness as you discover problems. Anybody who used the old expressiveness, they're now made incompatible. Their software no longer works. The other option is start with minimal expressiveness. This is the path that Bitcoin chose. And then over time, gradually increase the level of expressiveness of the system to add new capabilities. We chose that. We just started a little bit more to the right. And Vossel is an example of us moving even more to the right. And so every hard fork moving forward, there's going to be some increase of the expressiveness when it's determined that that actually benefits real life use cases to the system. The advantage is the old stuff still works, but the new stuff usually is better, faster, cheaper, and in many cases gives you the ability to do lots of cool and new interesting things like oracles and algorithmic stable coins and DEXs and so forth in the system at high performance and scale. Yeah, that's helpful. And um, I guess, you know, just, just double clicking on the, the, UT, the UTXO model, um, I guess, is that basically why other, you know, smart contract platforms haven't uh, tried it out? It's just because it's... Um, uh, you're starting from no expressiveness and you kind of can't really bring on, uh, you know, dApps until you establish that. And it's just a little more difficult and time consuming to go that route or, or are there other challenges well, to that model. Well, in the beginning, it's quality over quantity, because if you have the quantity, the vast majority of stuff doesn't work. And the stuff that does work probably is going to get hacked. And then you'll have a great consumer experience until you don't. And then people lose all their money. And then the regulator shows up. We saw this with Luna and the bridges and these other things. So what we said is, let's do a select set of things really well. So like issuing an asset, uh, some basic smart contracting functionality, and then every so often upgrade it so that you get more and more things that can be done. With Vossel, I think we're at a point where we have comparable programming model to Ethereum. You know, many of the things, if not all the things you can do on Ethereum, you can now do on Cardano. But the difference is you have certified contracts, you can have a high degree of safety inside the system. And also it's easier to get high performance and predictable pricing. One of the cool things about the UTX model is determinism. So you can predict the operating cost ahead of time. You don't just hope that it works a certain way and then the network tells you you're wrong and you lose all your gas. You actually have determinism inside your fees and pricing, which is a unique uh, USP. The other thing is the dominant accounting model is still UTXO because the, the vast majority of money in the cryptocurrency space is still in Bitcoin. So there are lots of Bitcoin core developers that are trying to figure out how do we use UTXO for lightning and for what sidechains 
uh, for uh, Blockstream. I think it's their liquid framework or elements or whatever they call it this day. And all these innovations that El Salvador is trying to do to create a nation scale payment system, they have to do that on Bitcoin, which means they have to be UTXO developers. So there's 13 plus years of history of understanding with UTXO. And it's only about six years of history with Ethereum style accounts uh, for developers. So there's twice as much time and twice as large of a development, if not three times larger development pool of people that are UTXO native. So what happens is when people start looking at it, they find enough familiarity and they understand this model already, especially all the people that have built wallets and other things. What's really exciting is that you get all that goodness, but then suddenly you have programmability and where the pedagogy is really starting to advance. And we have discords now with, I think, 20 or 30,000 developers in them, which is well more than enough to get that initial wave of applications. Now, where do we base that justification from? We base it from what Steve Jobs did with the iPhone. If you look at his partnership with John Doerr at Kleiner Perkins, they created something called the iFund. They put about $100 million into a startup fund that basically would incentivize the construction of uh, applications on the iPhone. And they said, we need to get about 150 to 500 really good experiences in order for this thing to take off. And that's really what we've been focused on. We have the C fund, which we set up, and then there Emergo, another venture arm in the ecosystem. And then there's the decentralized capital of Catalyst. All three of us have invested very heavily. And we're starting to get to that critical mass of a few hundred great experiences and independent teams that will basically allow to showcase that ecosystem. And that's what brings in your big wave of people. And then your language evolves over time, your ecosystem evolves over time, and you, you get to a critical mass. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one element of, of bringing you know, liquidity to the network, uh, obviously, there are a few core elements, um, you know, one being bridges, the other being native uh, you know, asset-backed stable coins. Um, these are two very key initiatives highlighted by IOG um, that the network of the developers are trying to implement on Cardano. Um, you know, I think it'll it'll likely lead to a wave of both developers and you know users uh, coming over, bridging over, uh, using stable coins to transact. Um, could you maybe provide an update on you know where things stand with uh, both bridges and stable coins? So with respect to Jed, um, they're in the final audit phase, and I suspect that they'll probably be in market in some form in 60 to 90 days. There's always versioning and upgrades to do, but there's a great regulated entity in Israel called Cody that's the first mover on that, but it's an open standard, the Jed standard. And it's actually already been deployed on Ergo, another blockchain, uh, as something called Sigma USD, which was quite fortuitous because we actually got real market data from the downturn. So despite the fact that Ergo, I think, fell like 80%, or 90% from its all time high, the peg held within a range of 97 cents to $1.3, which is a good indication that these protocols are robust under catastrophic market conditions for algorithmic stablecoins. Uh, but it's nice to have a Hyperloop style model where you write the paper, you design the system, and then third parties take it and implement it, and they can compete with each other, and we can see. Uh, which models people prefer. But we think that's going to be one of the big drivers of TVL. And it's also a requirement for a lot of things that we'd like to do in 2023. Like, for example, microfinance in Africa, you need some form of stable asset to be able to lend to people. The issue with custodial assets, like asset best stable coins, is one, the regulation is not clear. Two, if they're not native to your system, if a bridge gets hacked, you lose all the money because it becomes unpegged, as we saw with the Nomad Bridge to the Cardano ecosystem, where a hack on the Ethereum side led to the destruction of value on the Cardano side. Mm -hmm. So the challenge with bridges are actually less about building a bridge, and it's more about consensus of standards and security. So we've developed a lot of artifacts like NEPA PALs for proof of work. Uh, there's proof of stake sidechains. There's now this new paper proof of proof of stake. And these are great mechanisms to basically ensure trustless uh, atomic swaps between systems. The issue is that in their actual implementation, there's no certification standard to verify a bridge is safe or not. So we've been working with a lot of different people in industry to talk about bridges between systems. It's quite easy to build a bridge with Ethereum. It's already been done once before on a Cardano and Ethereum, and others are working on it. Other ecosystems like Ergo, for example, are constructing a bridge to Cardano. It's a lot more challenging to build a bridge with less programmable cryptocurrencies, for example, like Bitcoin. The issue here is that while it's understandable on the Cardano side, Bitcoin can't understand a bridge. So you have to have a trusted third party, federated ideally, that basically acts as the custodian to facilitate the movement of assets to and fro. This is one of the key limitations of that system, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Uh, but we're definitely working on it. And part of it is a standards-based conversation. 
Part of it is an academic conversation of what you can and cannot do. Part of it is also a conversation of what type of asset are you moving? Is it a cryptocurrency? Is it a user or is it information? For example, cross blockchain communication. Hmm. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Is, is, do you have any sense for how uh, a stable coin that is algorithmic in nature like Jed uh, would be affected by uh, proposed regulation? Because, you know, there was a lot of talk out of Congress recently about, um, you know, uh, endogenously backed stable coins. Yeah, and this is a great question. And this is an example of the need for regulated DeFi, because what's going to happen is that nations like China or the United States or sectors like the European Union are going to have differing opinions of what's allowed, what's not allowed. Some jurisdictions, for example, don't let you short sell. Others do. So what you need to do is you need to be able to bake into your system that the users of the system are under the jurisdiction of a particular legal framework. And then you can decide whether they're blacklisted or whitelisted accordingly. So JED, for example, as it rolls out, because we have the PRISM framework, one of the things that the JED developers can do in their particular instantiations of JED is put in whitelists and blacklists. So what that effectively means is that if you're a US holder and the United States bans it, uh, well, then you can't hold it. You can't use it in the network. You have to get a refund. Whereas if you're European and endogenous stable coins are allowed, then you can transact freely. And you just kind of let regulatory markets decide and it creates walls of liquidity. This is especially important in the security tokens market of being able to identify who's a broker dealer, who's an RA, who are all these different actors and who's allowed to hold the security, who's allowed to transact that security. And also what level of privacy is required for this particular transaction and which escrow agents need to be in to receive a, uh, a, a transparent view of the uh, transaction. So we're working very closely to build frameworks for that. And I think this is going to be one of the core USPs of Cardano because its base use is just like Bitcoin. It's a pseudonymous open system, but then it allows you to do regulated business on top of it. And the users get to decide where that's appropriate for their business domain. Yeah, no, I mean that that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, there was actually a question here from from the audience pertaining to security tokens. Um, obviously, the um, the use case of you know a globally liquid twenty four seven security tokens it's it's pretty obvious, right? Um, is there are there any projects currently working on bringing securities to? Uh, yeah, there's several, uh, Occam Phi and others that are uh, projects that are specifically in the security tokens domain. Most of them are in Europe. Uh, it's several are based in Switzerland. Uh, I believe there might be a few US-based projects that are considering or connected to it. And uh, the challenge with security tokens, I've done a lot of consulting in the years over it. Like I worked with Polymath, which was one of the largest offers of security tokens, and I helped them design the Polymesh framework. As well, the technology is one conversation. The regulatory upgrade required to give agency to security tokens is quite a lift. And what ends up usually happening is that you have something that's an asset, but then it has to be bound within some sort of legal wrapper that has agency and that has securities that are connected to, and it's uh, an entry point. So there's a bit of regulata regulation upgrades and, re and clever business structuring that's required to even allow you to use security tokens in the, uh, in the cryptocurrency space. Mm -hmm. This said, there's a lot of excitement in jurisdictions that view security tokens as a way to do mini IPOs and get global liquidity. So especially in Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, in the LATAM markets, a lot of people trying to construct security token frameworks as a way to attract direct foreign investment into local companies and create basically transnational stock exchanges uh, that run better than the local exchanges that have low liquidity. So uh, that innovation is certainly happening. And there's a lot of cool stuff that, again, getting back to the native asset standard and the coupling with identity, these are key things alongside multi-sig, which would be required to layer on a broker-dealer style system into uh, a security token model. But if it's going to operate in the European or US markets, which have very clearly defined rigid regulation, then unfortunately, you're going to have to have a physical layer that's grafted on, that's trusted to accommodate it. It's much like Bitcoin. Sure. The, well, you know, Bitcoin is our our old man. And, uh, you know, the security industry, the US, United States regulatory framework is kind of the old man in that respect. <laughs> and so you just kind of have to deal with the consequences of the rigid, unchanging system. And you have to build all this infrastructure that's suboptimal in order to be able to utilize it because the direct way of utilizing it, you can't do for regulatory. Yeah. So, so would that, would that high level compri be comprised of like building a semi-permission layer two, or, you know, is that kind of how the architecture would look? 
Yeah, it would probably be something like that was a collection of incorporated entities that hold licenses and file reports to the Securities Exchange Commission. And plenty of people have come up with different schemes. The other thing is that you need an upgrade on privacy standards in order for people to comply with this. Uh, so usually what ends up happening is you have to go with maximal privacy on the transaction level, but then it's confidential. So meaning that you have back doors for regulated actors to unblind the transaction when they want to do an investigation or look into something. Uh, so th there's a lot of moving pieces to figuring out how to put all this together in, in a decidable framework. Yeah. And we've thought about it for a long time. And there's certainly several uh, regulated entities that are exploring this uh, in the European markets on Cardano. And hopefully we can get more excitement in the U.S. side as well. And I imagine this is going to be a big thing once we have some legislation that comes down the pipe. There's a very high probability that the Financial Innovation Act is going to merge with the Biden executive order in 2023, mm -hmm. and some bipartisan bill will be passed to give regulatory clarity. And once that occurs, I think security tokens will be significantly easier because the old man's upgraded itself. It's learned a few new tricks, and then we'll see that explosion in that market. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. That's makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so so you mentioned privacy a couple of times there. We have a few questions here pertaining to privacy, um, and a few related to identity, which you mentioned a few times. I think I'm just going to meld these together, and perhaps if you could just speak through, speak to um, privacy, digital identity, how you balance the two. I hear you, you know, going to governments and. Um, creating solutions for, uh, you know, identity where there's no infrastructure for mm -hmm. um, proper ident identification methods. Um, I guess, you know, the question boils down to, you know, how do you balance, you know, user privacy and government overreach if there's this interaction between the two uh, when establishing digital identity? So the key is that you have something that's private by default. And then in the business domain, you pre-select actors who have the ability to make that transaction not private. So for example, if you're talking about dealing business with person to person, then obviously the both people, if it's Alice to Bob, would have the ability to have transparency in that transaction, but the rest of the world can't see it. If you're talking about person to a regulated entity like an exchange, like Coinbase, that not only do they need to see that, you need to actually generate some proof that you own addresses in order for them to withdraw to comply with the travel rule. So you can do all of that with encrypted DIDs that are carried in the metadata of the transaction, meaning that normal people have no idea what it is, but anybody who has the decryption keys of that would be able to see that transaction and be able to unblind that transaction and associate it. And it's escalating levels of unblinding. So uh, if it's just a did, but nobody knows who that did maps to, it's pseudonymous, a decentralized identifier. But if somebody's done KYC on that did, like Coinbase has, so when they unblind that did, they gain the additional context context that it's it's John or Alice or Bob who owns that. But if a regular person on, decrypted it, they would just see a, an identifier and they'd have no way of knowing who that's connected to. So even decrypting it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a loss of privacy. And then you can start introducing other concepts like uh, perfect forward secrecy or other things to actually, whenever your time's expired, it destroys the ability to do those types of decryption. So there's a lot of conversations right now about how to layer those systems in. Some are SNARK-based, so zero-knowledge cryptography-based. And the advantage there is you get proofs that only are about that relevant item. I've paid my taxes. Yes, no. This is audited money. This is a US citizen. This person's over the age of 21. This person's an accredited investor and has filed all the requisite disclosures and so forth. Nothing else. Right now, how we handle identity is quite crude. So you go to a bar, you say, I like a beer. They say, okay, show me your driver's license. And you put it down and they don't just know that you're at or over the age of 21. They know your name, your address. If you're an organ donor, they have a picture of you, all these types of things. And what if they take it to the back room and take a picture with your cell phone? Now they have that forever. And do you want them to have that? No. Well, with zero knowledge cryptography, you just produce a proof of one item. Are you over the age of 21? N nothing else. So the way we've constructed our identity system is that over time, it can grow in that direction. And then every user of the system will have that as a programmable framework, and they can use that in the construction of their dApps. And they can use that whether it's a security token dApp uh, or it's a uh, or it's uh, you know a, a, a DEX. So the same with the tornado crash issue. And you want to have privacy in all your trading, but maybe you want to create a situation where 
the KYC space can be unblinded by global regulators or something like that. So they understand who's trading. You could build systems like that. And they're permissioned in that you, when you as a user use that, know upfront that that is the identity environment you're operating in. So you start by default with the same values and principles that Bitcoin had, but then the dApps can have specific trust assumptions and privacy assumptions about them, and you consent to using it, you know upfront that you're consenting to use that. Yeah, I mean, I got to think that that would have, um, that would be, uh, definitely be a 10, 100x better than the uh, solutions we have today. So yeah, um, excited to see that come to fruition. Um, on that note, we, you know, we're, we're running out of time coming up on the hour. Uh, so I guess, you know, last question, it's another combo question. Uh, succinctly, over the next six, 12 months, we'll say, what is the single thing you're most excited about? And then conversely, uh, no time horizon to this question, but what do you see as the biggest risks to Cardano or just crypto overall? So the thing I'm most excited about is the age of Voltaire. It's the last era of the original uh, surge to build Cardano. And the age of Voltaire is really about governance and how do we engage and activate the millions of people using Cardano and get them to contribute to it. So that goes from collection of core entities that's in the thousands of people to millions of potential engineers, developers, business professionals who contribute to the common welfare of that. That's an army. And it's a nation state. I mean, it's like the size of Zanzibar. You can do a lot with that many people all around the world in more than 100 countries. And so it's a huge amount of effort to get that done in a way that it works well. And that's what 2023 is all about. Now, in terms of threats uh, to the cryptocurrency ecosystem, I think the issue is less about what can kill crypto, and it's more about what would knock it into a state where it's suboptimal. If our intention is to try to take the power of cryptocurrencies and just rebuild what we already have with the incumbent banking system, not only have we done ourselves a disservice, but we've created a reality where the people who don't do that will end up having a significantly better financial system and ultimately collapse the other two. So it's very important from a, both a regulatory and a technology perspective that we truly understand the value proposition of crypto. It's inclusive accountability, your ability to check things, not trust people. It's decentralization, which implies resilience. So the system can never be brought down. It's censorship resistance saying that certain big powerful actors can't destroy the little guy. It's global meaning that everybody has access to it. And ultimately it's egalitarian. So as we bank the 3 billion people who are unbanked, those people have equal access and consideration to everybody else in the world. So as long as regulation doesn't get in the way of those principles, and as long as the infrastructure doesn't get in the way of those principles and we maintain those things, I think we're okay. If it does get in the way, not only do I think it's not going to work, I think people will continue building systems that have those values, and ultimately those systems will become more valuable, more powerful. So all you're doing is just kind of putting yourself out of business, uh, just like the newspapers did in the 1990s and all the people with curated content did in the 1990s against an open internet. Well said, Charles. Well said. The Age of Voltaire sounds like a, uh, sounds like a really good album name. I don't know. Um, it's got to be Pink Floyd. Sounds like something to go ahead. It's got to be like Pink Floyd, you know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there, there you go. go. I, I guess, you know, Charles, we, we got to have, I guess, one more question. You, you got to answer to the uh, that red thing on your, your mic. What's what's up with the lobster? Oh, this is uh, this is a lobster, and this just shows you the power of the community. So a little stuffed lobster I bought on Amazon, and it was uh, something I put on. I didn't tell anybody about it. I just put it on. And eventually, because I do a lot of AMAs, the community started asking, what is the what is the lobster? What does it mean? And I said, oh, it's just a lobster. You guys should name it. So we created a smart contract and people from over 100 countries participated and uh, the smart contract named the lobster. So the lobster's name is Logan the Lobster. And it's become quite a quite a big thing in our ecosystem. People actually make artwork. They've issued NFTs on it now. I think the lobster is probably worth a million dollars. And so that's a pretty good return going from $13 to a million dollar stuffed lobster on the, uh, on the microphone. Uh, can't, can't argue with those returns. That's That's for sure. All right. Well, Charles, I uh, appreciate you coming on today. I think you answered a lot of very uh, uh, astute questions. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to, to John Bay to, to send us off. Thanks again. Thank you.
Yeah, once again, thank you, Charles. Uh, that was extremely informative. Uh, and to all our uh, participants, uh, thanks again. We will be sending out the uh, replay. Uh, if you have any further questions regarding Cardano or anything, please reach out to us. Have a great day. Thank you.